Hey there, and thanks for tuning in to the Talent Empowerment Podcast. We're here to help you love your job, unpack the tools and tactics of successful humans to guide you towards your own career empowerment. I am your purpose-driven little host, Tom Finn, and on the show today, we have Adi Janney. Adi, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom, for having me. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, well, I'm thrilled to share your story and your journey. Uh, it's going to be really fun to get into all the details of your life and your life's work. And if you don't know Adi, let me just take a moment to introduce you to him. Uh, he's a senior partner at Cayburn Hope, and Adi's passion lies in empowering employees and redefining the customer experience to catalyze and organize growth within organizations. Now, he's done some great work with industry giants such as Coca-Cola, BT, Pfizer, Amazon, leading diverse projects on rewards and recognition, brand enhancement, corporate culture, and internal communication as well. So he's not just a consultant. He's also the founder and CEO of Gemcast Live, an app that offers high-quality jewelry at affordable prices. He's done work as a producer and a filmmaker, my goodness gracious, you are a charcuterie plate of uh, varied experiences, my friend. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Entrepreneurship, consulting, uh, film, production. T- tell me, how would you describe your path? Uh, well, I mean, it goes back to when I was very young. Uh, I think uh, I was like probably seven or eight, uh, where I basically wanted to be a filmmaker that's a kind of still like a hidden passion of mine making movies but i think what i really understood as i grew older um is the fact that i love to tell stories um and whatever form that takes i just um uh, you know be it whether you're uh, presenting on tv be it whether you're actually directing a movie or uh you know consulting because stories are something that connects all of us we we basically tell each other stories uh to make sure we understand each other better yeah i love that i love the idea of storytelling and i think we get it from the producer director movie kind of standpoint but how do we tell stories in business so uh it's interesting actually um my kind of specialty or the specialty of the company that I work for, uh, it's called Cave and Hope, and we've been specializing in employee engagement. And the element of storytelling comes in to uh, the entire communication spectrum within an organization. When any kind of communication is passed, uh, there's two forms, really, if you think about it. There's a transactional level of communication and an emotional level of communication. They both need to work in synchronicity. Is that a word? Uh, I don't know. Synchrony. I don't know. Let's let's make it a word. <laughs> if you want to make it a word, we'll make it a word. <laughs> they, but basically, they both work need to work in harmony. That's a better word. In harmony, in order for the message to land. So, uh, for example, it's it's more like the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. The left side of the brain is more analytical, data-driven, whereas the right side is more creative. But I think what makes us function as people is basically a combination of both. So we need to be analytical and we need to be creative as well. So just in the same way, uh, the transactional information from HR, for example, processes, implementation, uh, you know, data, content, all of that stuff that is that every business needs to pass down to the employee. Nine times out of 10, in my experience, I've learned that uh, people are so pigeonholed in their jobs that all of that kind of communication is just kind of goes into spam. Basically, they they just don't, they just ignore it. But the only reason or the only way for it to land is if we make that interpersonal connection with individuals within the organization. That's where the element of storytelling comes in. And I love that about my job. All right. So let's, let's dig in a little bit. Um, I think what you said makes sense to me. Uh, we've got transactional and we've got personal. Is that the best way to describe it? I'd say emotional. Emotional. Okay. Yeah. So transactions and emotion. So how do we create communication, whether it's making a film or uh, delivering an HR email, which was your example, right? right? Yeah. How do, we, how do we actually write that? Transactional is easy, right? We have to do this at this time. 
yeah, the yeah. company's changing this or that, whatever it might be. But how do we actually add the um, the emotion or the personality to this? I, I think there's a level of uh, research involved. Obviously, um, we have to uh, basically understand our our audience, and this is where um, Cape and Hope, especially, um, approaches these kind of messaging in a very marketing sort of way where um, the the employees become our customers essentially so when it comes to marketing what do you do you before you implement any marketing strategy you do your focus groups you do your research all of that stuff the same thing needs to happen within an organization for internal communication i'm not just saying for every single communication i'm just saying get an overall idea of what your employee wants and there's multiple ways of doing that, such as focus groups and such. Uh, and once you understand uh, the need, the requirement, then you implement a strategy. So we have a three-tiered approach, uh, how we usually approach with the communication of any kind, of, generally speaking, of any kind. Uh, first is we inspire. Second, we engage. And third, we inform. So it's almost like a pyramid if you think about it. Inspire is at the top where we create the big picture, inspiring, uh, you know, feel good kind of communication. Uh, then engage is where we connect with your, uh, with your employees, with your organization. Um, where we, be it through social media posts, uh, surveys, etc., uh, holding sessions, one-to-one sessions. Uh, and then once we've got their engagement, once we've got their buy-in, it's a lot easier because they've got their, it's almost like, you know, change is a very difficult thing. People put their guards up straight away. So once you, once people are involved and engaged, they bring their guards down and it's a lot easier to deliver a message. Yeah. Well said. Um, and then, so we inspire, we engage, we inform, um, the inform part, is that the tactical component? Uh, that's the, I, I'd say the transactional part, but still it's, it needs to be, uh, weaved in um, in a very personal way, but that message for the for the message to land. And for example, uh, I mean, I just had a meeting today with a client who actually said, you know, we they invested heavily in a um, rewards kind of platform, um, and uh, the biggest problem that they were facing right now is getting their employees to start using that platform because obviously the company spent millions and millions of dollars. Uh, on this package for you know hundreds of thousands of people in their company and they're getting about three percent engagement uh, that is <laughs> not a good roi oh adi so- you're you're hitting on the notes of uh you know my heart right now and i will tell you that engagement is one of the most important things that an organization can focus on but it's also one of the most overutilized statements by vendors that don't actually produce results. So most vendors all talk about engagement, 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 fine. But let me tell you, pet insurance, life insurance is not engagement, okay? Mm-hmm. Most rewards programs or HR platforms are not engagement. Your workday no. system does not create engagement in your company, no matter how many times they want to tell you that it does. So the reality is you have to have a partner in the engagement space that has some skin in the game, right? Trainers, mentors, coaches, systems, platforms, they're all out there. But who is actually a partner that has some skin in the game that says, if it doesn't work, in your example, if I have 3% utilization, do I get some money back? Where's that contract? Exactly, exactly. And uh, you know, you won't believe me, Tom, I've actually been to about four different seminars in the last two, two and a half months. A lot of these seminars were promoting their cloud package system, et cetera. I mean, those are great. Don't get me wrong. They they, they kind of, once you've got the buy-in from the employee, they help you fulfill what you want. Sure. But it's getting the buy-in in the first place. And that was one of the most fervent questions that was asked in all of these seminars is like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll buy your product. How do I get my customer? How do I get my people to use it? So, uh, absolutely, you're right. We we need to have some skin in the game, and uh, basically, to understand, you have to put in the hard work. You, there's no magical solution that okay, just spend fifty thousand dollars with me, buy this package, and all your problems will go away. It doesn't work like that. That you have to have uh, 
you have to spend the time to really understand your employee. And uh, personal experience as well, uh, you know, uh, in the past, I've been working in, in jobs where I've had experiences where it's not, so it, it's really interesting because when I started one particular job, which I won't name, <laughs> but one particular job, uh, I started absolutely loving it. and loving every second of it. I would go in early, finish late, all of that. So I know it didn't, you know, they say when you enjoy your job, it doesn't feel like work. It, it's play. So that's what it felt like. I spent a, quite a large chunk of my life there. And when I left, I couldn't wait to leave. Because I, I think it's not, it's the fact that when you start climbing the, uh, the ladder of work and more responsibilities are added on you, et cetera, the, the work culture changes and uh, you have to adapt to that work culture. And, and more so than often, uh, a lot of the people that are around you, especially in senior leadership, they don't understand how to manage people. Uh, basically, they've been basically told, okay, you're a manager now, go and manage your team. They know how to do the work. They don't know how to manage people. That's an entirely different job. And I, I know, uh, I think Simon Sinek says this really, really well. Uh, where it's one of his, uh, one of his shows uh, or one of his speeches or TED Talk or something. He's done so much. But uh, it's absolutely true. People don't tell you how to manage people. and. Uh, so basically, <laughs> the reason why I ended up leaving that job is because the uh, my boss essentially was creating a extremely toxic atmosphere, unknowingly because and it's not his fault. He didn't know how to manage people. I I, I hope he does now, but like he, he didn't know it back at the time how to manage people. And so I kind of forget where I was going with this, but my, my whole point was. Uh, that, uh, you know, when it comes to employee engagement, you want to get your team engaged. You have to understand them. That's where I was going. That's exactly where I was going. There you go. You have to understand them. <laughs> <laughs> you brought it back full circle, my man. Don't worry about it. Um, no, I, I think you're hundred percent right. You've got to understand your people. And yeah. the other part of this is that managers have not gone to manager school. There is no manager school. Now yeah. people might say, Oh, I have an MBA or I've gone and got a graduate degree, or, or have an undergraduate degree, that's not management school. Um, they teach you the tactics of finance, accounting, yeah. organizational structures, um, some basics in sales methodologies, but that is not management school. And, and managing yeah. people yeah. is about people. It's about the human touch. It's much more emotion than it is transaction. And you have to, absolutely. Yeah, you've got to have a little bit of both, but you're 100% right. Most of us have not been to management school, and that is where we end up hitting a ceiling in our career, certainly in corporate roles, where right. you climb, 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 and then boom, you hit that ceiling because yep. you don't have the skills to get to the next level. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the larger, I mean, the more you grow, hopefully, uh, if your organization is doing something right, the organization is growing with you. And then it's the same thing with an organization. It, it hits a ceiling where uh, it can't break this barrier off. And there's a lot of companies uh, trying to break this barrier. And when I was in one of my previous roles, I actually, you know, one of the meetings I had with the CEO was like, we want to be the next billion dollar company, right? So first it was $250 million company. Then it was $500 million company. Then it was $750 but it could never get past that 1 billion marker because in order for that to change, to happen, infrastructural change needs to happen because you're now dealing with hundreds of people. It's no longer a startup anymore where you have a team of 15 people or, uh, you know, an SME even because where you have a team of say a hundred people. Now you need a team of 600, 700, a thousand people in order to break that barrier. And the more people you have, the harder it becomes to engage them because they then they get pigeonholed within their own specialities. How do you bring it all together? And this is where uh, employee engagement uh, services can really, really uh, benefit for a company. Yeah, well, well said. I'm glad you took us there. 
So let's let's talk about you for a second. So you've done some entrepreneurial work. Um, That's right. And yeah. and you've done some work in corporate roles, which is cool. I've done the same. Um, and I think a lot of folks out there will start perhaps in corporate roles, go into entrepreneurship, come back into corporate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's there's different ways to think about it. Do you do you think about your career as like a career with a side hustle? Or do you think about yourself as an entrepreneur with a day job? Like, how do you actually frame this in your own mind? A very interesting question, actually. Uh, I see myself as, uh, see, for me, it's doing something that I love. So uh, when when you're talking about Gemcast Live, I love doing that. I I love, uh, because of my background in jewelry as well, um, I've learned a lot. And so from a business perspective, as well as from a sales perspective. So I really, really enjoy doing that. So it doesn't really feel like work anymore. Uh, And same thing with my consulting, because I'm so passionate about how uh, employees connect with their corporations. When I'm spending time with Cape and Hope, I don't realize where the time goes either. So I think for me, making things more fun that I enjoy doing, I can do them all the time, which I pretty much do. (laughs) Well, that's a great way to look at the world and honestly a great way to live and go through your career journey. So let's, um, let's unpack, uh, gem cast live, uh, which is a jewelry business, um, that, that you founded and operate, uh, today. So tell us a little bit about that business and uh, where it came from. So the idea came from once I moved, uh, so I used to live in Texas, um, 2021, August, I moved back to the UK. One of my parents were over here, so I wanted to be close to the family. Um, and when I moved, I wanted to do something of my own. Like you said earlier, you know, a lot of people who work corporate decide to become entrepreneurial. It's kind of my story. Um, I wanted to have the flexibility of uh, doing my own work whenever I wanted it. And so I went about setting up a app, essentially, because I looked at um, what the market was doing. And I did a bit of market research and I learned that um, MCOM, which is basically mobile commerce sales, were uh, skyrocketing year on year. Um, I identified an opportunity. So and, and basically, I used to work at a home shopping network. So I've got a bit of TV background. I wanted to bring that element to the mobile phone, essentially. So on the Gemcast Live Jewelry app, uh, we run shows where you can watch on your phone and order uh, while the present presentation is going on, essentially. So it's it's basically like Amazon, yes, but it's also got a home shopping element. So the home shopping live show is where we can actually showcase the jewelry live and uh, we give special discounts if you watch the live show, etc. Nice. So yeah. So let's let's dig in a little bit. So you download the app. Yep. You uh, do can I purchase? Can the, I just cold purchase? Can I go on there and find jewelry and just buy it or do I have to wait for the live show? No, no, you can go and buy it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh it, so we don't uh as it's it's still a startup, uh, we don't do as many shows as we would like. We would want to get to do a show every day, yeah. but we do currently we do every couple of weeks. Um, so at the moment, though, you can the, the jewelry is there. It's like Amazon, the app as well. Just just search for whatever you want: rings, earrings, pendant, anklets, bracelets, necklace, whatever you want, in different gemstones. Uh, we basically try to keep the price points low. Um, so I think our average selling price is around twenty-seven pounds, which is about thirty-five, thirty-six dollars. And um, sterling silver, uh, vermeil gold, stainless steel, um, and uh, we do some uh, stainless steel as well as titanium steel, as well. Nice. So this is jewelry for everybody. This isn't super high end. You know, I've got to spend a fortune and break the bank. This is, you need a couple of pieces. You want something that's fun, that's wearable, that you can really not feel, not feel too guilty about your purchase, uh, by, by overdoing it a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that was very important for me. Uh, I did have the opportunity to bring in like, you know, your big, 
rare gemstones and stuff like that, that the price point would just skyrocket. And I understand like right now everyone's struggling, man. Uh, and it's good to kind of keep, keep, keep it simple and keep it affordable. Uh, great, great lesson there. Keep keep it simple and keep it affordable. Uh, that's that's probably a good lesson for the next decade for all of us. Uh, right. Yeah. Lo- love the way you said that. All right. So so the gem the gem life. We've got the consulting life, and then yeah. we do some things in production and film. So you said at the beginning of the show, hey, I wanted to I want to be a filmmaker, and wow. when I was when I was a little guy, and at some point you did some work in film, um, yeah. in 2011, you won the best young filmmaker award at the international that's film right. festival in Cardiff. Uh, so that was that's back right. in 2011. So that's over a decade ago. So wow, tell us well, yeah. how you, how you got into, how you got into film and are you still, are you still fiddling around with uh, filmmaking? Yeah. I, I love that, that part of my life. It's, uh, anything to do with filmmaking or, even shooting blogs, etc. I just love filming. Um, and the last film I made, uh, I say I was little, but it was only in 2016. <laughs> so, um, but it was my uh, master's film, actually. So I did my master's in filmmaking, in directing uh, from the Met Film School in Ealing. Uh, and the final graduate film of that uh, was uh, my, the last film I made. So I kind of, you know, I have a passion for, uh, you know, the maison scene, so to speak. Like, you know, um, I love being able to control what the audience sees. Um, and basically every single object within a scene, I know right now I just have a white ball, <laughs> but uh, every single thing a person sees on screen me- is supposed to mean something, essentially. So I love, th- I love that part of uh, filmmaking, visuals. Obviously, um, I'm a bit of a tech geek as well, so I love CGI, all the Marvel movies, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, and at the same time, it's uh, about not just visual storytelling, but storytelling of any sort. Yeah, look, I, I think that's coming through loud and clear. You, you love storytelling, whether it's um, working on Gemcast Live, uh, telling stories about jewelry, or uh, working in consulting, telling stories about uh, HR and engagement and, and employees, um, really feeling like they belong at an organization because the story is right or, right. or it's being behind the camera and, uh, really loving what you do and, and creating positioning for different pieces in a scene. I think storytelling is, is just so important in today's day and age, right? Cause it's how we remember things. It's not absolutely, it's not just your passion. Um, I mean, it's cool that it's your passion, but for, for the rest of us, that's actually how we remember. We just don't consciously think about it that way, right? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. I, I think someone said this, I, I heard it recently, uh, maybe a month or so ago. Can't remember who exactly, but what you just said reminds me very much of that. And he said like, it's basically memories, our memories are the stories we tell ourselves. It might not be the exact version of what happened, but that's how I remember it, right? It's our versions of the truth, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is why when you have differing opinions and people are saying, no, I'm right. No, I'm right. You just never <laughs> get anywhere because we've all yeah. told ourselves whatever it is that we want to believe anyway. No. Uh, yeah. Wow. I walked into that bar and I saw her hit him. No, but you never saw he punched her before. Like what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. There's always a few sides um, to the story, uh, no, no matter what we do. So what's yeah. what's next for for you? I mean, where where do you go from here? I mean, you've, you've done quite a bit um, and you figured out what your purpose is or or what your passion is, at least. You figured yes, out your purpose uh, yet? I think I'm starting to. Uh, maybe the, I still have a little bit to go, but um, I definitely know I want to do basically something to do with storytelling whether i will still end up making movies i don't know maybe five years from now we should have another one of these and see where i end up um but uh definitely doing uh telling stories i I love that uh part of my life and i think i what i see and how i see things uh visually when i observe the world is through stories as well i always tell people like oh i wonder what she's doing i wonder what led her to this point you know kind of thing uh, but yeah, next up, if you think about, um, I, I would I'd love to do consulting work and I'm going to continue to do that. Um, 
I think I'm just getting started in this space, and I think I have a long way to explore uh, and a lot and, and a really, really uh, exciting journey ahead. But I'm also uh, looking at my other passions, uh, such as filmmaking. So I'm looking at uh, filmmaking as well. I'm also making a game right now. Uh, I've set up a little company with me and uh, about three other guys, and we're working on a game uh, made in Unreal Engine, which is uh, a fantastic free resource for any game developers out there. Okay, so say, so we're working on a game, and when you say game, you don't mean uh, the remake of Monopoly uh, and a board game. <laughs> uh, no, no. It's one of the, those PC uh, console games, either PlayStation or Xbox, one of those. Uh, so at the moment, I'm working on a PC game called Hayden, uh, which is uh, hopefully going to be a um, third-person free-roaming sort of world. that I'm, It's an original IP that I'm creating myself, that I've been creating actually a little bit of history about that. I wanted to make that into a film and we ended up shooting a pilot. This was back in 2014. So that story has been swirling around in my head for a very long time, almost 10 years. And I'm finally getting to make it into a game. So I'm really excited about that. Nice. I, you know, I love it when something we do years ago comes back full circle in a yeah. different form, right? You a probably form, completely, yeah. You, you didn't think of it in 2014 as a video game. You thought of it no as, a, as a film, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and now you're thinking of that story as as a video game. How how hard is it to set up these companies to divide your time to kind of have focus in different areas? Help me understand how you deal with that. So I'll uh, basically. I, I, my wife will probably disagree with me, but uh, I consider myself sort of organized. I'm not as organized as her, but uh, what, I try, what I generally tend to do is I, I focus on my consulting work. And basically, what you first want to make sure is you pay all your bills, right? Your rent, your bill, etc. So make sure that is given priority. But uh, everything else kind of, you can find time for it. And like I said, if it's, play for you it's not work right so you will just find time for it and i i generally tend to spend my weekends working on my games uh maybe if i get too bored i get slightly distracted i'll work on some film uh i'll work on some other projects like i i recently helped um with cape and hope we're shooting this uh video blog so uh, i was like hey i'm interested in doing that so i'm kind of helping out with that it's kind of keeping me distracted i think variety is the spice of life yeah, well said. I, I agree. I think you've got to do lots of different things in your life to figure out what you want to do and what gets you going. Uh, exactly. And a lot of people, a lot of people have this model now around the world, which is I've got my day job and I'm going to perform at my day job to pay my bills. I'm going to do a great job. But then on the weekends and at night when I've got free time, I don't have to watch Netflix. Uh, yeah. I can I can be more productive in things that uh, stimulate my mind and my heart and my soul that are good for my family and uh, that really support the growth of human behavior, whatever it is that drives yeah. you uh, to really like get after it on the weekends. Right. Absolutely. And have some fun. Absolutely. And, and you don't even realize uh, where the time goes in that sense, you know, like, like, you know, it's three in the morning, like, Oh wow. I've got to, I've got to wake up at six in the morning, but Hey, ho, <laughs> it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. I love it. So, so what do you say to, to the next generation of people that are either coming out of school or looking for jobs? Do you think they go to a corporate role first or would you encourage them to just kick the tires and be, you know, poor entrepreneurs for a while? Ooh. Uh, so if someone was to tell me uh, about 20 years ago uh, what to do, I would uh, basically tell them have multiple options, do multiple things. And especially in today's day and age, you need more than one revenue stream essentially coming in. You need to have multiple revenue streams with such a volatile kind of climate that we're living in. Um, it's important to not put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, multiple revenue streams is always what the rich and famous talk about, right? No, <laughs> they, they, it doesn't matter if you're an actor right? Um, if you're, if you're Ryan Reynolds that now owns a soccer team or in, uh, in the Queens English, a football team, football um, team yeah. or Wrexham United, yeah, it's actually yeah. got a documentary on Disney plus. 
That's right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Or or your or your Dwayne the Rock Johnson who was a wrestler that became an actor, who became yeah. a comedian, who became a a czar of uh, tequila. I mean, <laughs> speaking of multiple yeah. revenue streams, there's there's so many great examples of that uh, where people are really focused on finding different ways to generate revenue for themselves yeah. um, and put value yeah. out in the world that's that's differentiated. And yeah. I, I love and, and the, I love that that's your model. Thing is, I think it's um, you have to try different things because not everything is going to succeed. In fact, probably 90% of the stuff is not going to succeed, but it will teach you so much uh, about the next thing or the next thing after that or the next thing after that. Eventually you're going to get there. What was it? Uh, you know, uh, PayPal was Elon Musk's what 47th idea or something before it succeeded. Like those 47, seven duds before paypal <laughs> so there's the, before any kind of big success and we're all in our own independent journeys to that success yeah i i agree i think the hardest part for any entrepreneur out there um or, or look even if you have a corporate role you struggle with this too like dealing with failure isn't always fun uh no. it's not always pretty there can be economic impacts social impacts family impacts Failure is not always uh, a great day at the office. How do you, how do you actually deal with that um, with with an iron stomach, so to speak? Yeah, um, it's a lot harder sometimes than others, uh, for sure. And especially, I, 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 see, I can deal with failure if it just affects me, right? But I'm at a position in my life right now that I have a family, a wife. Uh, we have a dog. Uh, I have my parents to look after. So there, there's an impact. Uh, if I fail, there's these other people that might get impacted. So it, it gets a lot harder as you go older. But it shouldn't, as long as you have their support, it shouldn't stop you from still taking the risk. Yeah, I, I love the way you look at the world, man. It's, uh, you've got to take the risk. But it's got to be calculated, too. You don't have to do foolish sure, things, sure. right? You can, you can You can put money on the table. You can say, I'm going to push X amount towards this project and just see where it goes. But what you don't want to yeah. do is get flip with your, with your cash and pour too much in where now you've created a situation where you, know, you put yourself in a bad spot, right? That's, Absolutely. that's what we're trying to avoid. Yeah. I, I just, just be careful about that. Like you, you have to, um, Basically, there's, I think, uh, what's the formula? It's 80 20. So, like, if you have 100% savings, 20% of it can be invested in your personal projects or your business idea or your creative project, whatever it is. 80%, I think, you can still kind of keep and just be careful with because, I mean, like you said, the time is tough right now. Um, and hopefully, within the next few years, it gets different. But, you know, we always have to be careful. Yeah, well, well said, um, and we will leave it there, my friend. Um, great to hear about your storytelling, the life that you're leading, um, the work that you're doing in film and video games and consulting, all around the idea that storytelling matters. And I, I love uh, the way that you're looking at the world with multiple revenue streams and your creativity. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to live. So kudos for you for uh, carving out your own path and doing it your way. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for having me. And thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Adi. So if people wanted to get in touch with you, um, what would be the best way that they would uh, reach out? Yeah, so uh, uh, LinkedIn is probably the best. Uh, A-D-I-J-A-N-I. It's my name. Um, I've got a very corporate looking picture on there. Uh, so uh, feel free to add me. Uh, send me a connection request. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if you had any questions uh, or, you know, just wanted to say hello. Yeah, if you want to make a movie uh, or if you want to engage employees <laughs> or if you uh, you want to work on a video game with Adi, that, he's the guy to check in with. Um, he's got a diverse background. So we, we love hearing these stories, my man. And uh, thank you uh, again and best of luck uh, with your next adventure. Thank you, sir. It was a pleasure being here. And thank you for tuning in to the Talent Empowerment Podcast. We hope you've unpacked a few tips and tricks to love your job, find your side hustle, find your creative juices. Get ready to dive back into all things career and happiness on the next episode. We'll see you then.